Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chirag Agarwal, and I'll be the moderator for today's talk. Uh, I would like to first start by thanking everyone for joining our trust for the ML seminar series today. Uh, also, I would like to inform everyone that we are being recorded and live streamed on YouTube uh, till the first hour of the talk. If you do not want to be recorded, I suggest you exit Zoom and watch this talk on YouTube. Feel free to join us again in Zoom anytime after 1 p.m. ET, which will not be recorded. Uh, I'll now pause for a few seconds for people to move to YouTube. So uh, before we start today's seminar, I would like to briefly introduce the Trustworthy ML Initiative. We started out as a group of people which informally discussing this broad area of research encompassing uh, explainability, fairness, robustness, and different various other uh, desirable traits that we want our machine learning models to have. So our initiative has multiple goals. Uh, for easy access to resources, we provide a curated list of introductory to advanced resources on our website. We also want to provide a platform for early career researchers, and we have uh, several rising star spotlight talks lined up for the same. Uh, finally, we plan to organize uh, symposiums and workshops in the near future to strengthen our community. So uh, I would request everyone to keep an eye out for the announcement. So uh, back to today's agenda. Today's session is divided into two parts. The first hour is a talk by our speaker, and it will be like a moderated uh, talk with question answers uh, taken by the participants. The second is a free for participant driven discussion. The speaker will be giving the talk till uh, 45 minutes. And if you have questions in this duration, please kindly submit it to the Zoom Q&A tool. They will be answered periodically. And if time permits, we can have more technical questions. After the first hour mark, we'll take a five minutes break and then we'll reconvene uh, after five minutes for a fun discussion with all the participants. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Jen Watman Wan. Uh, we are honored to have you with us today as the speaker of our seminar series. Uh, Jen is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research uh, New York City. Her research background is in machine learning and algorithmic economics. And in recent years, she has turned her back, uh, she has turned her attention to human-centered approaches as part of Microsoft's Fate Group. She's the recipient of UPenn's 2009 Ubinoff Dissertation Award for uh, Innovative Applications of Computer Technology, a NSF Career Award, a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and some Best Paper Awards too. Today, she is going to talk about intelligibility through the machine learning life cycle. And I'll now tell uh, Jen to please share her slides and the floor is all yours. Great, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Give me one second. Okay. Can you confirm that you can hear me and see my slides? Yeah, good to go. Fantastic. I love it when things just work. Okay. So, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be part of this series. So today I'm going to be talking to you about intelligibility throughout the machine learning life cycle. And throughout this entire talk, I'm going to be arguing for the importance of taking a human-centered view of machine learning. So, ah, hold on one second, that should have switched. Okay, there we go. So I don't know about all of you, but um, I've been going to all of these virtual talks lately and I find them a bit exhausting. Um, and I find it a lot more difficult to actually connect with the audience when we're not all in the same room. So one thing that I've been playing around with in my talks recently is just starting with a little bit of backstory about my own research interests and how I came to be interested in the topics that I'm going to be talking about today. So, We'll start with that. So uh, my own research training was in two areas. First, machine learning theory, and second, algorithmic economics. So roughly, this means that in most of my past research life, I've spent a lot of time designing algorithms and proving formal mathematical guarantees about these algorithms. And I still spend a fraction of my time on that today. But 
These days, I also spend a lot of my time on these human-centered approaches to transparency and intelligibility and fairness and responsible AI more broadly. So I often get asked how this happened. How did I make this transition? And I can trace my interest in these topics back to this kind of specific time in 2016 when I went to Washington, D.C. for one of these panels on AI and society that you now see happening all the time. And during this panel, one of the panelists made this claim that soon our AI systems will be so good that all of the uncertainty will be taken out of our decision making. And to me, this was just an utterly horrifying thing for someone to claim, especially in a room full of media and lay people and others who are not necessarily experts in machine learning. Now, the world is just full of uncertainty, right? And all of our AI systems and our machine learning models are going to have this uncertainty baked into them, whether it's explicit or not. Right? And to me, it just seems so irresponsible to tell people that AI can somehow take uncertainty away. So I came back to New York after this talk fuming about it, and I ranted about this to my colleague and good friend, Hannah Wallach. And Hannah and I ended up spending the next month or two just dissecting this claim and why it was that it bothered both of us actually so much. So just for a little context, this was right around the time that there started to be all of this talk about democratizing AI and making it easier for lay people to build and deploy their own machine learning systems. And it was also right around the time that um, Hillary Clinton's chance of winning the United States election was hovering around 80%. And the general public and media were just treating this as a done deal. And just watching all of this play out and repeating this panelist's quote over and over in my mind, I became obsessed with this question of how well people really understand the predictions that are coming out of our models. Now, as a machine learning theorist, I was trained to always state my assumptions really clearly and explicitly. This kind of stating of assumptions was really core to how I work and what I do. And I just became afraid that people may not always understand the implications of assumptions that go into a machine learning model or the uncertainty behind predictions. So these worries led me to look into the literature and discover all of this literature that was coming out of the machine learning community on intelligible or interpretable machine learning. By the way, for the purposes of this talk, I'll use these terms um, intelligible and interpretable interchangeably. So I found this literature and I got really hung up on the fact that people were designing these methods without stopping to define it exactly what it is they mean by interpretability or intelligibility. And basically they were proposing solutions without first stopping to define the problem that they were trying to solve. So I started talking about this problem with colleagues of mine with backgrounds in psychology and other human centered fields. So people who know how to run really good behavioral experiments and know about user studies and all of this. And I started collaborating with them and running my own experiments and studies to try to see how interpretability actually plays out in practice with real people. And I just ended up getting really excited about this area the more that I started to work on it. And I've seen that it's really having impact in uh, the community and in practice at Microsoft as well. So this is now one of the major themes of my research and what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Okay, so just jumping up a level, why do I think we should take this human-centered approach to machine learning? Well, we often think about machine learning and actually we often teach machine learning in our classes as if it's this fully automated process, right? We take some data, we use it to learn a model and out come these automated predictions. But people are actually at the heart of the machine learning life cycle, right? It's people who define the task that machine learning will be used to solve. 
Um, people decide which data to collect. They decide how to clean this data and pre-process this data and how to label it. Uh, the data itself is often generated by people, either explicitly, for example, through crowdsourcing or more implicitly. For example, if the data contains images of people or text that people have written. People determine which model to use. Should it be a neural network, a random forest, a linear model, something else? People choose um, how to train this model, how to test the model, and testing may again require gener generating or gathering more data from additional people. People make choices about whether, where, and how to deploy models. And of course, once these models are deployed, they end up impacting other people's lives, sometimes in high stakes domains like medicine or finance. And finally, uh, feedback from these people is then incorporated back into the model as it evolves. So given the central role that people play in the machine learning life cycle, I take the position in my work that building machine learning systems that are reliable, trustworthy, and fair requires that relevant stakeholders have at least some basic understanding of how they work. So um, this idea is what we sometimes think of as intelligibility. And there are a bunch of different stakeholders of machine learning systems that can benefit from it. So to give just a few examples here, Intelligibility can improve the robustness of our systems by making it easier for the people building models, data scientists and engineers to identify and fix bugs. This is a major use case that we think about a lot within Microsoft. Intelligibility can help doctors or CEOs or any other decision maker determine when and how much they should trust a system. And this should ultimately lead to better decisions. Um, intelligibility can allow designers to reason about a system and model and its behavior so that they can then do a better job of conveying this to end users through their design. Intelligibility about the training data that's used and key characteristics of that data um, can help uncover potential sources of bias or unfairness in a model. It can help demonstrate compliance with regulatory obligations like GDPR and others. Um, it enables new tools that can help scientists who are developing their own, own models make predictions about the world, so knowledge discovery. And finally, intelligibility just generally leads to more usable products. Okay. So looking at the existing literature out there, there are two really common approaches to model intelligibility that are coming out of the machine learning community. So the first type of approach is to design and deploy transparent or sometimes called glass box models that are intuitively simple. So simple here might mean something like a small decision tree or a sparse linear model. Um, as one great example, my colleague Dan Goldstein and his collaborators have some really nice work on simple point systems that some decision maker, like a judge, could just memorize and apply on the fly. And they actually show that in many high stakes domains, at least when we're dealing with tabular data, so not things like uh, images or video or sound, um, then these point systems are nearly as accurate as more complex models like neural networks. Uh, another example I'll mention is some work that my colleague Rich Caruana and others have on um, generalized additive models or GAMs that falls into the same category. So the reason that GAMs are nice is that predictions have this nice additive structure which allows us to visualize the impact of a single feature. So you have one function corresponding to each feature and you can visualize that function. I'll come back to GAMs a little bit later in this talk. Okay, the second common approach is to design simple post hoc explanations for more complex models. So you may have heard of techniques like SHAP, like SHAP or LIME, and I would put those into this category. So many of these approaches work by approximating some complex function using just a simple uh, local approximation, such as a linear function, 
that can be easily explained. Uh, SHAP, which I'll also come back to a little bit later in this talk, builds on ideas from cooperative game theory to assign some notion of importance to each feature, which is just intuitively a measure of how much the feature contributes to an individual prediction. So there's all of this really cool research going on, but despite all of this, there's still a fair amount of disagreement in the machine learning community about what intelligibility or interpretability means and how to measure it. So just looking at these proposed approaches I mentioned, it's natural for you to ask what makes a model or explanation simple? How is simplicity related to intelligibility? And do these models actually help different types of users achieve their goals? Um, there have been a couple of great position papers examining this issue over the last few years. And as Finale Doshi Velez and Bean Kim pointed out in theirs, the machine learning community typically has this, you'll know it when you see it, attitude. Now, the difficulty of defining and quantifying intelligibility is compounded by the fact that there are different types of users or stakeholders out there. And these different users all have different needs in different scenarios. So the approach that works best for a CEO who's trying to make a strategic decision is likely to be very different from the approach that works best for a regulator who wants to understand why some individual was denied a loan. And this is probably going to be different from what works best for our data scientist who's trying to debug a model. Additionally, all of these approaches I've mentioned so far have focused on intelligibility of just the model itself. But if you think about this bigger picture of the machine learning life cycle that I mentioned earlier, model intelligibility is just really one piece of the big picture. And depending on who our stakeholders are or what goals they have, we may want to introduce intelligibility at other stages of the machine learning life cycle. So starting from the definition of the problem being solved and data collection all the way through to model deployment and feedback. So this collection of concerns has prompted me in recent years to adopt this human-centered approach to intelligible machine learning. And within the FATE group at Microsoft Research, we've been working on this agenda from several angles. So first of all, we propose that people just stop relying on intuition and instead empirically test which factors of a model actually enable users to better achieve their goals. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you about some work that we have in this space that examines how factors commonly thought to influence the intelligibility of a model impact people's use of the model. A second angle is to uh, consider intelligibility beyond just the model itself. So for example, intelligibility of data or objectives or performance metrics. And here I'll tell you about some work that we have examining how the stated and observed accuracy of a model impacts people's trust. Um, while I don't have time to talk about it today, another good example here is our work on um, our work in the space of data set documentation, which we call data, data sheets for data sets. Um, and this is a project that was led by the phenomenal Timmy Gibru during her postdoc at Microsoft. And um, I think of this work as kind of a potential way of bringing intelligibility to data sets themselves. Finally, we propose that people design and evaluate methods for achieving intelligibility in context with relevant stakeholders. And here I'll tell you about some more recent work that examines how data scientists perceive and use intelligibility tools. Um, I should mention also that my colleague Hannah Wallach and I have recently written a book chapter on this research agenda as a whole. So if you're interested in that, you can find it on my website. Okay, let me jump right into this first point. Okay, so to question our intuition about intelligibility and empirically test it, my colleagues and I found that it's useful to think about intelligibility as a latent property that can be influenced by different manipulable factors, 
So things like the number of features in a model, whether the model is linear, the user interface of a model, and so on. And that then impacts these different measurable outcomes. So things like a user's trust or ability to debug a model or ability to simulate a model's predictions. Now, notice that these properties on the left here are properties of the system design. Whereas on the right, we have properties of human behavior, right? So taking a cue from psychology, in a project that was led by Farouk Porsabzi Sangda, we designed randomized human subject experiments to try to isolate and measure the impacts of these different system factors on these fundamental properties of human behavior that are relevant to intelligibility. So the idea is to randomly vary these types of system factors like we have on the left and then measure the impact on human properties. While this may seem really simple, in practice, it's actually very difficult to do this while holding everything else equal. Okay, so in our experiment, participants were asked to make predictions about the selling price of different apartments with the help of a model. So they could see a model's prediction and then make a prediction of their own. So in addition to a simple baseline condition in which participants did not have access to any model, we considered four experimental conditions in a two by two design corresponding to these four models that you see here. So I absolutely don't expect you to be able to read everything on the screen, but let me point out differences between conditions. So first, the two models on top use two features while the models on the bottom use eight. Next, the models on the left are black box, whereas on the right, you see these transparent linear regression models with weights that are visible to participants. For these conditions on the right, we did actually explain during a training phase exactly how the models work. And finally, crucially in all of these conditions, participants see the same model input, so the same apartment features, and the same model output, so the predictions. So that is, we specifically chose apartments where the two feature and eight feature regression models make the same predictions. So then the only difference between these conditions is what people see in between. And this means that if in our experiments, we observe differences between people assigned to different conditions, we can safely attribute those differences to differences in the model. And this is super important for our design. Okay. So I won't go through our studies in detail today, but let me just mention a couple of key results from this paper and I'll point you at the paper if you're interested to learn more. So first, we found that participants who were shown a clear or transparent model, so not the black box, the one with um, clear internals, with a small number of features were best able to simulate the model's predictions or guess what the model was going to predict. Now, this is perhaps unsurprising, but it's reassuring to see in our data because it means people did actually understand what was going on in this two feature linear regression. However, we found no improvements in the degree to which participants followed the model's prediction on a typical example, when it actually generally would have been beneficial for them to do so. So typically the model was better than the people who were um, part of the study but we did not see differences between conditions about how often they chose to follow. Additionally, we found that in some cases, too much transparency can actually be harmful. Um, specifically, transparency reduced people's ability to detect when the model was making a sizable mistake and correct for it. Um, so specifically here, the linear regression model that we trained uh, placed a really high weight on the number of bathrooms. This was just what was appropriate to do in the data. Um, so at the very end of the study, we showed participants apartments with an unusual configuration, like one bedroom and three bathroom, for which the model made these really high predictions. And you, know, you might think that if people are able to see what the model is doing and see that it can place this high weight on number of bathrooms, this would alert people that something is going to be wrong here. But we actually saw that participants who saw the black box models were better able to correct for this than people who saw the clear models. 
So this is something that was really surprising to us. And in some follow-up studies, we saw that um, there's a lot of evidence this is likely due to information overload. Okay, and just more generally, these results emphasize the importance of user testing and experimentation over just relying on intuition when we're designing and evaluating intelligible models. Okay. I'm going to move on, but before I do, if there are any very quick clarification questions, I'm happy to take those at this point. Uh, we are good to go. All right, great. So let me move on to the second direction, intelligibility beyond the model. And here I'm going to briefly mention some work that was led by Ming Yin, who is now at Purdue. Um, and this work received a best paper honorable mention at CHI in 2019. Um, this work I really view as a study of the intelligibility of performance metrics. So in this study, we set out to examine um, whether a model's stated accuracy on held out data affects people's trust in the model. If so, whether it continues to do so after people have gotten to observe the model's accuracy in practice. And finally, how a model's observed accuracy in practice affects people's trust. So to do this, we again made use of randomized human subject experiments. Um, this time we showed subjects information about pairs of people who had been matched through a speed dating event. Um, now subjects were first asked to make their own prediction about whether a speed dating participant would want to see his or her partner again. They were then shown a prediction from the model. And finally, they were given a chance to revise their original prediction. They did this many times, um, completing 40 of these tasks in two phases. So at the beginning of the first phase, we gave them information about the model's accuracy on a held out data set. Then after the first phase, the first 20, we gave them feedback on how they themselves had performed so far, so their own accuracy, as well as the accuracy of the model on these 20 points. Um, finally, at the end, we had them answer a couple of questions about their use of the model. Um, now, in each of our experiments, we varied either the stated accuracy, so what we're telling people upfront about the model's performance, or the observed accuracy of the model, so this feedback that we're giving people midway through, or both. So these are kind of our randomized conditions here. Um, again, just in the interest of time, I'll skip right to the high level results and implications and point you at the paper for more. So first of all, here we found that a model's stated accuracy on held out data does affect people's trust in the model and specifically that they're more willing to depend on a model when its stated accuracy is higher. This is, this is reassuring this first point, but it's something that surprisingly had not actually been specifically addressed in the literature before. We also put, found that people put um, substantial weight on their own interactions with the model and the accuracy that they observe. Um, and you know, we saw this happen even though the subjects in our experiment had this pretty limited experience with the model. They only got to interact with the model for, you know, these 20 rounds before they got feedback, but they still kind of changed their behavior in the second half, putting some weight on their experience with the model. And just jumping right to kind of the high level takeaway, these and other results that we discussed in the paper really, to me, highlight the need for designers of machine learning systems to clearly and also responsibly communicate their expectations about model performance to users of a system. Um, we see in this experiment and others that, you know, this information does actually shape the effect to which people trust a model, both before and after they get experience interacting it with practice with it in practice. So I think there's kind of a wide open space for more research here and how we should be communicating this type of information to users. Okay, great. Let me move right into the final bullet here. 
So I'll spend the next couple of minutes talking about some more recent work that was looking at how we can evaluate the intelligibility of existing tools with stakeholders in context. Um, this was work that was led by an incredible summer intern, Harmon Cower, and this received a best paper honorable mention at CHI 2020 this past year. Okay, so in this work, we're zooming in specifically on the data scientists who are building models as our stakeholder of interest. Um, in particular, we're interested in how data scientists perceive and use existing off the shelf intelligibility tools. Uh, what are the challenges that they're facing in doing this? And what opportunities do we have to make these tools better? Before I get into the specifics of our study, I want to step back and talk a little bit about why this type of evaluation is actually really challenging. And I want to be super clear here that the reason that there's not more of this type of evaluation in the machine learning literature is not because machine learning researchers are lazy or just don't care, but because getting this type of evaluation right is actually super hard and kind of a research agenda in its own. Okay, so first this requires both expertise in machine learning and in HCI or psychology or other fields. This work needs to be done in an interdisciplinary manner. It also requires knowledge of both the academic literature in machine learning, um, as well as day-to-day -day engineering practices of data scientists or whoever our end user is. Um, it requires both qualitative analysis so that we can understand the nuances of how all of these tools are actually used in practice, but also quantitative methods to scale things up and get reliable findings. Um, to be the most convincing, such a study should mimic a realistic data analysis setting, but not be too cumbersome. In our case, we didn't want to keep participants for more than about an hour. And it requires separating out effects from the model, the intelligibility technique, and the user interface of a specific tool, which can be tricky to do. So to attempt to address these challenges, first, we recruited a diverse team to work on this project. So Harman, who I mentioned led this project, brought all of the HCI, HCI expertise that we needed. Um, our team also included a couple of machine learning researchers like myself, as well as a couple of data scientists who have practical experience both building and working with intelligibility tools as part of their day job. We also attempted um, to the extent that we were able to put these um, data scientists that we studied in a realistic context, and I'll get to that in a moment. Finally, we used a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods in our work. Specifically, we started with pilot interviews to identify the types of challenges data scientists actually face day to day. We then ran an interview study, which um, allowed us to observe data scientists' ability to use tools when they're faced with the types of challenges we identified in the pilot. And finally, we ran a larger scale survey with around 200 data scientist participants to scale up these results. Okay, so again, our goal was to evaluate data scientists' ability to use these tools um, to address the types of day to day challenges they face. So our first step was to try to understand the types of challenges data scientists actually do face um, in context in their work when they might use intelligibility tools. So this was the goal of our pilot interviews. Um, from these pilots, we extracted six common challenges. So missing values in data that can be sometimes filled in in arbitrary ways, uh, redundant features, duplicate data, changes in data over the time, ad hoc categorization, and just general challenges in recognizing debugging patterns. I'll come back to these in a minute. Building on these challenges, we designed an interview study in which participants are put in context. In this case, working with real data, a real model, and a real intelligibility tool. Um, and we wanted to explore both of the types of tools that I mentioned towards the start of this talk. So both simple, transparent models and also post-talk explanations. 
So we had half of participants use generalized additive models or GAMs and half of them use SHAP. Now, we began with a pre-study interview about prior experience and expertise in machine learning. And then we moved on to the main study and ended with some follow-up questions. For the main study, our participants were given a Jupyter notebook that was already set up for them. They saw a tutorial on the particular intelligibility tool they were going to use that was based on um, existing published documentation. Uh, with a bit of extra detail that we added. They then um, explored a trained model, seeing visualizations from the intelligibility tool. And finally, they answered some questions about the model uh, referring back to these visualizations. Okay, each of these two tools, I mentioned GAMS and SHAP, provide three types of explanations. So the first is local feature importance a description of how important each feature is for the prediction that's made on some specific data point. The second is global feature importance. So how important is each feature on the whole in aggregate across the data set? The third type of visualization uh, zooms in on the way that some specific feature, so age in the example I'm showing here, impacts predictions. Um, so we use this modified version of the adult income data set, which uh, predicts whether a household earns more than a certain amount of money. And we specifically modified this data set to reflect the types of challenges that we extracted during the pilot study to see if these could be identified. So as one example, data scientists we found often face problems due to missing values in the data and the way that these values are filled in. So before training the model for 10% of the data points that had positive labels, we removed the age value and used the common approach of just replacing it with the mean across the data set, in this case, 38. And this way of filling in missing values resulted in the model to exhibit this strange jump in predictions for 38 year olds that hopefully a data scientist would be able to notice and identify as suspicious. Okay, so jumping into our qualitative analysis, a couple of different themes emerged from our analysis of the interview data. So first we found that there was a set of participants who overused the tools, um, using them to justify cases where the model exhibited strange behavior. And this led them to put too much trust in the underlying model when they should have been suspicious. So as one participant who was given GAMS said, Age 38 seems to have the highest positive influence on income based on the plot. Not sure why, but I guess if that's what's shown, makes sense, right? Another participant who was given SHAP ran some tests on their own and then was willing to accept the model's behavior when those tests agreed with SHAP's output, um, even though you know, we would hope that they would be suspicious. On the flip side, we also saw some cases in which participants underused the tools because they weren't confident about exactly what the tool was showing them. Um, as one participant who used SHAP said, the tool assigns a quantity that's important to know, but it's showing that in a way that makes you misinterpret that value. Now I wanna go back and check all my answers. After checking their answers, they came back and said, okay, so it's not showing me a whole lot more than what I can infer on my own. Now I'm thinking, is this an interpretability tool? Um, another quite concern, concerning theme that emerged was the importance of social context. So in particular, we saw that participants seemed willing to trust what an intelligibility tool was telling them simply because it was a publicly available tool. And one actually said this explicitly, right? I guess this is a publicly available tool, must be doing something right. I think it makes sense. Okay. Um, so we thought that these qualitative results were super interesting, um, if a bit worrisome, but we wanted to scale up our findings. So we designed a survey to attempt to uh, replicate this uh, interview setting, but at scale. So the survey began with some questions about demographics and experience. 
Um, since we would no longer be able to have participants interact directly with the Jupyter notebook, we then showed them screenshots of common ways that our interview participants had interacted with the data set and model and tool. And finally, we asked them a bunch of questions about the data set model and tool that they could answer using the visualizations. We took advantage in the survey of having this larger pool of participants to run some randomized controlled experiments. Uh, we randomized two things here. So first, as before, we randomized whether each participant used GAMS or SHAP. And second, to understand how people were affected by the content of the explanations, we randomly showed half of our participants a manipulated version of global feature importance values in which we permuted features so that less important features were shown as more important and vice versa. So our qualitative findings here on the whole were very similar to what we saw in the interview study. I'll skip over this because I'm running low on time and I'll just highlight a couple of our quantitative findings. So first, Participants had higher accuracy on multiple choice questions about the visualizations when they used GAMS compared with SHAP. And participants who use GAMS were also more confident compared to those who use SHAP. So these are both somewhat evidence somewhat in favor of GAMS as being more useful to data scientists than SHAP here. Um, in terms of our experiments with the manipulation, we saw that manipulating feature importance values reduced participants' confidence that explanations were reasonable, looking at self-reported confidence, which is good. They were not reasonable. They were randomized, permuted. However, these manipulations did not lead to any increased suspicion about the model or the intelligibility tool. So even though they made people less confident, they didn't lead to the increased suspicion that we hoped a tool would help people get. Okay. So this work, I think, suggests several next steps for the research community that I'll just briefly highlight. I know I'm running a minute or two over, but we started late. I'll wrap up very soon. First, we need more interaction between machine learning and HCI researchers. And I'd argue we need that interaction to happen earlier, right? So these human-centered approaches should be incorporated into the design and development of intelligibility tools um, in addition to their evaluation, which is what we've done here. Um, second, we need more tools that are designed to encourage deep thinking and discourage people from making snap judgments. So one of our uh, study participants put this really nicely, I think, saying there's this concept in UX called thinking fast and slow. While these visualizations are made to make me think fast, every detail about them requires that I think slow. So I think this is a great direction for future work. And finally, in our study, we had only about an hour of time from each participant. And I think the community needs more long-term studies to explore how our understanding and usage of tools changes over time. Popping up a level, I told you about studies that we ran on lay people and studies we ran on data scientists, but there are many other stakeholders who require intelligibility. And there's a huge wide open direction for future work, better understanding the needs of these populations. And finally, again, I would argue that we need to take a broader view of intelligibility and think about how to bring it to every stage of the machine learning life cycle. All right, that is all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Jen. Uh, it was exciting. So we have like a few questions from our participants. So I would kindly ask at this point, uh, Guy Stevenson, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, uh, my question is, is there any concern with having too much intelligibility that causes users to overtrust the models? In particular, your results on transparency with the house pricing model seems to kind of point in this direction. Yes, definitely. I think this is a concern and something that, you know, if I, if I wanted to get very crisp on an answer, I would need to run um, studies that are more tailored at this point in particular. But, you know, we, we do see in this last experiment that I mentioned that um, the existing intelligibility tools, even with the amount of information that they're providing, are leading to overtrust. 
um, in some cases, not for all users, but for some users, we did see signs of overtrust and kind of reassurance just from the fact that they're seeing an explanation, even if this explanation um, should be causing them to have doubts about whether the model makes sense. Um, and in terms of too much information, I, I think that this is definitely a concern looking at the earlier study I mentioned where we had some evidence that, um, that too much transparency and especially when you have a large number of features can cause people to um, get a little bit of an information overload and miss out on red flags that they might otherwise see. So I think this is important. Um, one direction of research that I'm actually really interested in exploring there is whether this could be mitigated to some extent by um, interactivity and explanations. And specifically, you know, maybe you don't want to show somebody all possible information you could give them up front, but um, only reveal it to them on an as needed basis or if they ask for it. Awesome. So. I would now like uh, Divyansh. Can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, so I, ha I had a question about the finding that people updated their beliefs based on uh, feedback from the model. Uh, do you think it, we might see similar behavior uh, if, we, if instead of showing what a model's accuracy was, we said that, okay, uh, here's what person X predicted and person X had, you know, 95% accuracy uh, in a similar study that we did, uh, you know, last week, say, uh, and see if people change their, uh, if people update their beliefs then. Yeah, so you're talking about um, if we had a, like a human making predictions in place of a model, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Or so even just a hypothetical human. Yeah, so this is something that we've looked at a little bit. Um, so there, there is a lot of existing literature that um, found differences in how much, uh, how much people trust a human versus a model. And it's been a while since I looked at it, so I am a little bit scared to make firm claims here, but my vague recollection was that um, which way this goes depends on like how much the thing you're making a prediction about is perceived to be subjective versus objective, but don't quote me on that. Um, we, the, the only time that we've tried anything like this was in the first study that I mentioned to you where people were uh, making predictions about real estate. And we did in one of our studies, just throw in another condition that I didn't mention in this talk where um, it was identical to the black box model, except we told them that the prediction was coming from a human expert. And we saw no differences at all in that study between the uh, behavior with the black box model versus the human expert. But it's been observed in other scenarios. Thank you. Thanks for the answer, Jen. So I would now uh, request uh, Adrian. Can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, thanks for the talk. You're, you're, you're doing great stuff at Microsoft at Fade. Um, the, my question is, how does that work with the, uh, like in, in collaboration with the other teams? Um, how do you, is it like you, um, you go and you audit people's models? People, or do people come to you and ask questions? Um, if, if basically, if, I, if, I, if I'm trying to set up a, a, another team like Fade um, in another company, how would you go about integrating this team with the rest of the company and using these resources in their models? That is a really fantastic question and one that I don't think I can give a brief answer to. Um, but the very short version is we do kind of a mix of this. So um, when in my work with product teams across Microsoft, some of it is teams kind of coming to us with general questions that they have say about um, fairness or intelligibility and research is acting almost more like consultants and getting involved to some extent to talk through um, potential you know, questions that teams should be asking and just get them thinking about the right questions. Um, sometimes there are much more deeper connections, but um, yeah, this is something it's, it's, 
there, it, it takes many different forms. And I think we and other companies are still experimenting with exactly what the right model is, especially a model that scales. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so right now we have Rahul. Can Rahul, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Chirag. Um, love the talk, Jen. Big fan of your work. Um, so it was more of a technical question as you were presenting one of your studies. So you essentially said that, you know, there was more trust and confidence in GAM versus SHAP, or at least some version of that kind of conclusion. Um, but I mean, they're, they're kind of different things, right? I mean, one is a modeling technique and one is a post hoc explanation. So is the implication that you should kind of do more GAM as much as possible, especially for tabular? and not do more complex techniques? Is that, I'm trying to understand what the conclusion of the interpretation of that finding is. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right here that these, you know, specifically by design, because we wanted to look at, um, you know, one of these simple transparent models and uh, a more post hoc explanation technique, we kind of chose things that are very different and not directly comparable to start. So you're definitely right that it's hard to um, draw any firm conclusions or say that one is better than the other based on our results. Um, I think my main takeaway from that is just that people do for now seem to be more confident about what they're seeing in the visualizations from GAMS, but I wouldn't try to, um, to infer too much beyond that. And they, it is very hard to compare these. Got it, thank you. So right now we have one question from Joe. Can you please uh, unmute yourself? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, Jen. Uh, really awesome research. Um, I guess the question I had was um, in, in the uh, particular, in the studies, I guess, like the types of models and data that you looked at um, tended to be, um, I guess, like maybe for, for lack of better terminology, like maybe more on, uh, I guess, like a, a data science end where we're trying to, um, where I guess the, the thing that we're trying to infer is potentially something that isn't something that a human could do like predict the, predicting the price of a house or like, you know, predicting whether or not we will <clears throat> be compatible with somebody on a match versus I think like there are also a lot of machine learning systems where say if you're trying to uh, predict an object in an image, like that is one with an objective answer that a majority of humans could, um, could answer. And I think like those are also systems uh, where, you know, trustworthiness is, is you know, important in order for uh, the deployment of models. But I guess, like, could you speak maybe to how the work that you've done here could apply in that setting where, you know, maybe you're dealing with more complex inputs, but outputs, but model outputs that are, I think, a lot more easily verifiable. Yeah, so in the studies that we looked at, um, both with lay people and with data scientists, we did make this conscious choice that you're alluding to. Sorry, there's suddenly like crazy sun coming at me. Um, we did make this conscious choice that you're kind of alluding to here about um, choosing both, choosing domains that um, people could both understand the features themselves uh, without any particular relevant background knowledge and um, having some sense of how the outputs relate to features. Um, and this was because, you know, we, we wanted to really focus in these studies on the models or explanations themselves and not on the question of, you know, how people might be getting um, tripped up by not understanding features or by just having no intuition for the domain. Um, so you're, you're right that this was the case in all of these studies and that was by design. Um, I think that similar work could be done in the types of scenarios that you're talking about, but uh, the results we have don't speak directly to that. And I think there's also like a really interesting open line of work that could be done in just how well people understand features and um, how that comes into play. I guess that's a little bit different from, the, from what you're talking about, but I think there are a lot of interesting open directions there. Awesome, thanks. So um, 
Uh, Jen, I would I would be glad if you can answer uh, like like let us know about like what was what your journey and what motivated you to uh, do what you do right now or what motivated you to become a professor. Yes, I'm not a professor anymore. I was briefly, <laughs> but um, yeah. So let's see. I'll try to give you the not too long version of this. Um, I guess my trajectory is a little bit boring in the sense that I have been uh, wanting to do computer science all the way back from high school. Um, I actually credit this to taking a uh, class in high school, my first programming class with a female teacher who um, took a liking to me and really kind of went above and beyond to encourage me to go into this area. Um, what I focused on within computer science has changed a lot over the years. So. Um, I actually started out working in computer graphics and wanting to go in that direction. Um, and then during my master's, I was kind of rather harshly shot down by a graphics professor when I approached him about getting involved in research and ended up doing some exploration and um, discovering algorithmic economics. So I took a class in algorithmic economics, which had a lot of emphasis on game theory and formal logic and other topics that I just found super exciting and got really into. Um, so I ended up because of that, getting involved in research and also switching my master's concentration into AI because that was lumped into AI. And that's how I, first started taking classes in machine learning and all of these other areas and discovering machine learning. So I ended up doing my PhD in machine learning. Um, I ended up working mostly on the far theory end of machine learning to start because um, I found theoretical work very manageable. And I was very drawn to the fact that we had these nice lean models where we could very clearly write down all of our assumptions and exactly kind of the whole picture of what we were thinking about and everything would just naturally follow from these assumptions. Um, so I was drawn into that line of work, um, but kind of always with this angle of people and machine learning. So how do people interact with machine learning systems? Only because I was on the theory side, my people were often these kind of idealized theoretical models of people instead of actual people. Um, but somehow, you know, jumping ahead many years as I started um, being exposed to more social scientists and economists and people running behavioral experiments and all of this, um, I started incorporating more of these methods into my own work. And I, I talked a little bit about this at the start of the talk as well, but um, when I started becoming interesting, interested in fairness and interpretability in these topics, it just made more and more sense to turn to these methods. Um, yeah, and so I've had this kind of giant methodological switch, um, mid-career crisis, I don't know, something like this in the past couple of years. And now I'm not even sure I fully identify as a theorist anymore, even though that's where my roots are. Um, but yeah, that's a short version. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jen. Thanks a lot, Jen, for sharing that with us. Thank you. So I think we are towards the end of our um, seminar. And uh, I will just, yeah. So I guess, um, we'll thank Jen again for her wonderful talk today. And um, I would like to tell everyone that we'll be, we'll be taking like a few minutes break for now, and then we'll be reconvening around 1.05 ET for our participant discussion. Before we leave, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we will be having our new web social event on uh, the 9th of December. So uh, kindly join us uh, for a fun discussion about trustworthiness and all the other aspects of it. And uh, just an announcement for our next seminar. Uh, it will be on the December 17th, and we'll be having uh, Dr. Pin Yu Chen. And uh, he will be talking about the practical backdoor attacks and defenses in machine learning systems. So with that, I'll thank you, Jen, again. And uh, we'll meet in uh, a few minutes' time. Thank you. <laughs>